In his classic book, Knowing God, J.I. Packer begins the third chapter with a series of questions and answers. He writes, what were we made for? To know God. What aim should we set ourselves in life? To know God. What is the eternal life that Jesus gives? Knowledge of God. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. John 17, 3. What is the best thing in life? Bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else. Knowledge of God. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me. Jeremiah 9, 23-24. What of all the states God ever sees man in gives God most pleasure? Knowledge of God. I desired the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings, says God. Hosea 6, 6. Is there anything more important in life than knowing God? Is there anything more worthy of our time and attention than that? People spend countless hours in life uh, getting to know things. They know the names of the entire starting offense of the Buffalo Bills. They know the names of the 78 main organs of the human body. They know the names of the 118 chemical elements of the periodic table. They know the names of every player in the starting lineup of the New York Yankees for the past 20 years. But what do they actually know about God? And indeed, even for those who may know about Him, do they actually know Him? So this is the topic uh, with which we'll be uh, dealing this morning, knowing God. Uh, this is the topic upon which we'll be pausing to meditate. Uh, but before we turn to our text to get back into this book of Galatians, let's pause for a moment of prayer, committing our time to our God and Father, asking Him to illumine our minds by His Holy Spirit and to grant us greater knowledge of Him through His Word. So please just bow with me in prayer. Our Holy Heavenly Father, we we acknowledge our complete dependence upon you this morning, and we ask that you would illumine our minds by your Holy Spirit, that you would block out any distractions that would vie for your attention, that you would help us to set our minds on you, to set our minds on who you have revealed yourself to be in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. We ask, Father, that you would apply these truths in our text to our heart, and that you would draw us into ever more intimate fellowship with you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now our text for this morning is found in Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. And it's been a little while since we've been in the book of Galatians, but we're going to pick up right where we left off. Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. And this is the holy word of God. It contains what we ought to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of us. So may we receive it this morning by faith with reverence and awe. And we pick up our reading in verse 8 of our text. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God, 
how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Now, as we work through these verses here uh, this morning, we're going to do so with three points. First, those who do not know God are enslaved to idols. Verse 8, those who do not know God are enslaved to idols. Second, we come to know God because we are known by God. We come to know God because we are known by God. Verse 9a. And finally, we must guard against the idolatrous tendency of relying on anything other than Christ to secure our acceptance and favor with God. Verses 9b through 11. I mean, you can find that, of course, printed out on the back of your bulletin. So let's begin here this morning with point number one. Those who do not know God are enslaved to idols. Notice again what it says in verse 8 of our text. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. Now, up until this point in Paul's letter to the Galatians, and Paul has been defending the doctrine of justification by faith against the false teachings of Jewish Christians who were leading these believers astray from the gospel of grace. Now, they were causing them to rely on something other than Christ, something more than Christ to be accepted with God. And in these verses, uh, Paul's tone uh, sort of transitions from theological argumentation to pastoral plea. John Stott writes, We have been listening to Paul the apostle, Paul the theologian, Paul the defender of the faith, but now we are hearing Paul the man, Paul the pastor, Paul, the passionate lover of souls. So, at the very beginning of this pastoral plea, Paul reminds these believers of their miserable condition before coming to Christ. Their miserable condition before coming to know God. He reminds them of the, the spiritual darkness, uh, the bondage in which they once lived. And to remind them of that past condition, that miserable past condition, Paul emphasizes two points in particular. First, he emphasizes that they formerly did not know God. They formerly lived a life alienated and separated from the one true God. And that kind of life is a life that's utterly miserable. It's a life defined by sin and divine judgment. Listen to what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 5. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Again, in Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 19, Paul says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So the person who lives his life apart from knowing God lives a life that's defined by sin. It's defined by sin. Um, it's a life in which one is driven by his own passions and desires. He is ignorant of the will of God. 
And so he certainly isn't attempting to please him. There is no bridle upon his desires, no restraint or harness upon him. The world tells him to pursue whatever it is that his heart desires to find happiness. His whole purpose in life is simply to please himself. And he couches that to be respectable amongst men. But make no mistake, that is ultimately the end for which he strives. If he desires a member of the opposite sex, he pursues sexual relations outside of marriage. If he desires a member of the same sex, he pursues homosexual relations. If he desires the possession of his neighbor, a possession that he cannot afford for himself, he plots to steal it. If he desires to hide his faults and shortcomings from others, he lies. If, an, if any authority opposes his will, he disobeys it as long as he can bear the consequences. If anyone overshadows him, he becomes jealous because he covets the glory for himself. He is dead in his trespasses and sins, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. I mean, that's a life apart from knowing God. Make no mistake. Don't listen to the lies of the world that try to embellish how much fun they're having. They're miserable, and they have no hope. They're without God in the world striving to prop up their happiness with vain, futile idols. It's a life defined by sin, and it's an utterly miserable condition. Now, not only is this condition of not knowing God defined by sin, but it's also defined by divine judgment. Go ahead and turn with me for a moment to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. The Holy Spirit speaks through Paul, saying. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Make no mistake, when the Lord Jesus returns in flaming fire, he will inflict vengeance upon all those who do not know God. So this is the miserable condition um, in which the Galatians once lived, separated from Christ, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Indeed, this is the condition in which we all once lived without Christ. There was once a time in which we did not know God. We may have known about Him, but we didn't know Him. There was once a time in which we were lost 
groping about in the darkness of this world, abiding under the righteous wrath of God. In fact, there may be somebody here today who remains there still. Maybe you have knowledge about God, but you don't really know Him. You fear that you're still far from Him, deep down inside, abiding under His wrath. But remember that we were all once there in that same place until the light of the gospel of grace flooded our hearts. And that very same gospel of grace is proclaimed to you this morning. God freely sets before you His Son crucified for sinners. He freely sets Him before you and He calls upon you to believe upon His Son. He freely sets before you the forgiveness of sins by faith alone. Christ bore the wrath of God on the cross in your place to reconcile you to God. So believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now, the second point that Paul emphasizes here is that those who do not know God are enslaved to idols. Notice again what it says in verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. In his Institutes of the Christian Religion, John Calvin famously refers to man's nature as a perpetual factory of idols. A perpetual factory of idols. In other words, in the absence of knowing the only true God, people constantly construct for themselves gods of their own imaginings. They constantly construct gods which are no gods, but the futile ideas of the minds of men. And then they construct all of these ways um, in which to do things to earn acceptance and favor with these gods. They serve them as idols. Now, this doesn't only refer to an idol of wood or stone. It can refer to anything that fails to conform to the revelation of the only true God. Anything that originates in the vain imaginings of men. For instance, listen to Martin Luther criticizing the Church of Rome And the way only Martin Luther could do, he writes, The wicked say and confess, I am a monk. I serve God with vows and ceremonies. Because of this, he will give me eternal life. But who tells you, says Luther, that you thus are worshiping the true God when he has not commanded these things? Therefore, you have made up for yourself some God who wants these things, although there is no true God who requires this or who wants to give eternal life because of this. What then are you worshiping except an idol of your own heart, whom you think the righteousness of your works pleases? I mean, think about that. Isn't that the the common error? of every false religion in the world? Don't they all teach that we can somehow earn the acceptance and favor of God by our works through merit? Whether we're talking about the the Roman imperial cult or the, the pagan gods of ancient Greece, or whether we're talking about the religions such as Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and even Roman Catholicism. They all try to approach God in a way that is inconsistent with what He requires, which is only to fabricate an idol in the factory of the human heart. So that's the the miserable condition of all those who do not know God. Their life is defined by sin, and divine judgment, and they're enslaved to idols. 
And so Paul warns these Galatians about the danger of turning away from the revelation of God in Christ by reminding them of their former condition. Now, that brings us here to our second point this morning. We come to know God because we are known by God. We come to know God because we are known by God. Notice what it says in the first part of verse 9. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God. In contrast to their past miserable condition of living apart from God, Paul points out that these believers have now come to know him. But what does that mean? What does it mean to know God? Does it simply mean to know about him? Or does it mean something more? For instance, I may know a lot about the President of the United States at any particular point in history. I may know about his career, his family, his education. I may know about his, his policies. But that doesn't mean that I know him. And it certainly doesn't mean that he knows me. If I were to see him on the street, he wouldn't come over and give me a hug. Now, if we look at the usage of this term in Scripture, it seems clear that Paul means something more than intellectual knowledge. He isn't simply referring to knowledge about God. He's referring to knowledge of God. He's referring to knowing God relationally. In fact, he's referring to nothing less than eternal life. In John 17, 3, it says, And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent, the only true God, the living God, not idols. In other words, coming to know God refers to coming to know God through Christ, which is eternal life. It refers to being brought into fellowship with the only true God through faith in Christ. Now, this experience of salvation involves turning away from idols to worship God. Go ahead and turn with me for a moment to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians. And let's begin by, by looking at verses 4 through 5. The Holy Spirit speaks through Paul, saying, For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. I mean, that's how Paul knows that these believers are elect that they have been chosen by God in Christ before the foundation of the world because once he proclaimed the holy gospel of God, the Spirit applied that redemption to them as they heard the gospel and they believed upon Christ. So through the preaching of the gospel of Christ, these believers who formerly did not know God have come to know God. Now look down at verses 9 through 10 with me. And notice what it says. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So coming to know God refers to coming to know the only true God through Jesus Christ. And that means that through the preaching of the gospel, a sinner's come under conviction by the Holy Spirit. The preaching of the gospel is accompanied with, with full conviction. He becomes keenly aware of the weight of his guilt before God. 
of the fact that he does not know God, that he's separated from God, that he's alienated from God, and that if Christ should return right now in flame and fire, he would inflict vengeance upon him. And with nowhere else to turn, he looks to Jesus Christ, who was crucified for sinners. And looking to Christ, he hears God's gospel promise applied to him. Repent of your sin, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Embrace Jesus Christ and receive eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. In other words, to be reconciled to God is to be brought into fellowship with the living God through Christ is to turn to God from idols, to turn to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, no longer fearing judgment, but longing for the consummation of the union between Christ and his church, the bride of Christ. All those who who love his appearing, longing for Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. I mean, that's what it means to come to know God, is to be brought into fellowship with the living God through Jesus Christ. Jonathan Edwards writes, It is the only remedy which God has provided for the miserable, brutish blindness of mankind. It is the only means that the true God has made successful in his providence to give the nations of the world the knowledge of himself and to bring them off from the worship of false gods. Now, how exactly is it that you come to know God? Is it because of your initiative? Or is it because God first knows you? Notice again verse 9 in our text. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, Paul's language there means that the priority is God's knowledge of you, not your knowledge of God. You come to know God because God first knows you. Let me give you an illustration. Philip Ryken writes, Imagine a tiny baby girl living in an orphanage. A man comes for a visit as he sees the baby lying in her crib. He loves her so much that he adopts her into his family. She grows up to call the man father because he is the only father she has ever known. But she knows him as her father only because he first knew her as his daughter. This is the love that God has for all his sons and daughters in Christ. Think about that. The only reason you come to know God is because He first knew you. He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world so that it wouldn't be based upon anything that you have done. He lavished His love upon you solely by His sovereign grace. J.I. Packer writes, The word know, when used of God in this way, is a sovereign grace word pointing to God's initiative in loving, choosing, redeeming, calling, and preserving. In fact, this this whole idea of God knowing us is rooted in the Hebrew word yada. I mean, that word just means to know in its most basic sense, but it's often found in the context of God's electing love. For instance, in Amos chapter 3, verse 2, the Lord God says to Israel, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. 
you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Now, does that mean that the all-knowing God only knew about Israel? Does it mean that he had no knowledge of any other families upon the earth? No, it means that he took the initiative to bestow his electing love upon them. He chose to intimately know them. In Genesis 18, 19, the Lord says with reference to Abraham, for I have chosen him. Literally, for I have known him, yada, in the Hebrew. That he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. So this is referring to God's initiative in bestowing his elective love, his electing love upon his people. Just as that baby girl in the orphanage only knew her father because he first knew her. She only came to know him as father because he first chose her. Now, think about how this word is taken up in the New Testament. We have it here in our text, of course. But notice also what it says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. And you could just go ahead and listen uh, to this. 2 Timothy 2, Verse 19, but God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Let everyone who professes to know the Lord depart from iniquity. The Lord knows those who are his. I mean, God knows those who are his because he chose to lavish his love upon them. But it's also the case that those whom God knows, all those whom God knows, come to know him. Listen to the words of our Lord Jesus in John 10, 14. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. All right, they hear my voice. They follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Again, in verses 27 through 28, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Right? I mean, if Christ knows us, then we'll come to know him. And he will give us eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So now that we've seen that those who do not know God are enslaved to idols and that we come to know God because we're known by God. Let's move on to our third and final point this morning. We must guard against the idolatrous tendency of relying on anything other than Christ to secure our acceptance and favor with God. Notice what it says in verses 9b through 11. And let's begin at the beginning of verse 9. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years, I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. You, you once lived apart from knowing God, Paul says. You once experienced the miserable condition of a life defined by sin and divine judgment, a life enslaved to those who are by nature not gods. But now you've come to know God through Christ. Now you've, you've been reconciled to God through Christ. You've been pardoned, you've been forgiven, you've been brought into eternal fellowship with the only true God, so how in the world could you now turn back to idols? Now, it's clear from the context here that 
that Paul is no longer referring to pagan idolatry. For instance, we know that these Galatians are being led astray by false teachers to submit to circumcision to secure their acceptance with God. These Judaizers in Galatia against whom Paul is writing. And so here, Paul demonstrates the extent of the Judaizing taking place. He says, you observe days and months and seasons and years. Listen to William Hendrickson explain why these terms are referring to the Jewish calendar. He writes, Since Paul in the entire preceding argument has made it abundantly clear that he is mainly attacking the false doctrine that law works are the road to salvation, and since by law he is referring specifically to that of Sinai, the Mosaic law, it follows that here in chapter 4, verse 10, he is not referring to days, months, etc., that pertained to this or that pagan system of religious worship, or even to some mixed syncretistic cultus, but definitely to the Sabbath days, days of the new moon, festival seasons belonging to the Jewish cycle, and either the Sabbath and Jubilee years, or the new year, Rosh Hashanah, on the first day of the month, Tishri. Paul is saying that strict observance of such days and festivals has nothing whatever to do with securing the divine favor. Now, if that's the case, and that's what Paul is referring to here, then what does the past life of these Galatians, when they formerly did not know God, what does that have to do with submitting to circumcision and the Jewish calendar to earn acceptance with God? I mean, what's the connection between the two here in Paul's argument? The answer that ties them together is that they both have to do with approaching God apart from his revelation in Christ. They both have to do with with approaching God idolatrously. Think about it. If you add anything to Christ, whether circumcision or the Jewish calendar, or penance, or whatever. If you add anything to Christ as a requirement of securing your acceptance and favor with God, you're partaking in the same kind of syncretistic, idolatrous worship as pagans. You're no longer worshiping the only true God in accordance with His revelation in Jesus Christ. You're now worshiping an idol fabricated in the factory of the human heart. Again, probably Luther himself put it best. He writes, Whoever has fallen from the doctrine of justification is ignorant of God and is an idolater. Therefore, it is all the same whether they afterwards returned to the law or to the worship of idols. When this doctrine is taken away, nothing remains but error and idolatry, however much it seems outwardly to be the truth. The reason is that God will or can be known in no other way than by Christ. Now, this is a tendency against which every sinner needs to be on guard. Because the human heart is a perpetual factory of idols. And if you know your heart as well as I know mine, you know that to be true. It's constantly seeking to add something to the work of Christ. To bring something to the table in our salvation. Whether circumcision again, or or the Jewish calendar again, or penance, or sacraments, or works. But the true circumcision, worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Those are the ones who have come to know God in Christ. 
Those are the ones who have received Christ and who are resting upon Christ by faith and who understand that their hope is all bound up in Christ. Now we have to ask just one more question at this point. Is it even possible for someone who has come to know God in Christ, someone who has received the gift of eternal life, is it even possible for him to fall away from grace once and for all? There's a particular passage that's helpful in this regard. In Titus chapter 1, verses 15 through 16, it says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. They profess to know God, but their works show otherwise. If someone turns away from Christ to espouse an idolatrous life once again, and they never return to Christ, not a temporary backsliding, but a rejection of Christ and a turning away from Christ once and for all, then they were only professing to know God. I mean, they didn't actually know God. They were only professing to know God, but they were never actually known by God. Because God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal the Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. You profess to know God, depart from iniquity. But guess what? God knows all those who are His. So we began this message this morning with a series of questions and answers from J.I. Packer's classic book, Knowing God. He writes, what were we made for? To know God. What aim should we set ourselves in life? To know God. What is the eternal life that Jesus gives? Knowledge of God. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. John 17, 3. What is the best thing in life, bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else? Knowledge of God. This is what the Lord says, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me. Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. What of all the states God ever sees man in, writes Packer, gives God most pleasure? Knowledge of himself. I desired the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings, says God. Hosea 6.6. 6. Can you say with certainty this morning, with a clear conscience this morning that you've come to know God? Have you come to know God in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? There's no other way to know the only true living God. In Christ Jesus, God freely offers eternal life to all who believe. He freely offers reconciliation and salvation for sinners. He freely offers the forgiveness of sins to all who believe. Indeed, all He requires of you is that you believe. Receive and rest upon Christ by faith and you will be saved. Embrace God's free grace in Christ and you will be saved. 
Christ Jesus shed his own blood to save sinners. He was raised from the dead on the third day, and he will come again from heaven to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all those who believe. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, what a glorious, glorious, glorious truth it is to know that you have reconciled sinners to yourself in Christ so that we might know you, the only true God, and experience the joy and bliss and blessedness of eternal fellowship with you. Oh God, don't let us lose sight of that glorious reality and be satisfied in anything other than you. Wean us from this world. Destroy the factory producing idols in our heart so that our heart would cleave to Christ alone, resting upon Christ alone for our salvation, longing to please you, our Heavenly Father, who would bestow such bountiful grace upon us in Jesus Christ. You chose us before the foundation of the world. We know you because you first knew us. What a wonderful, wonderful testimony to your sovereign grace. There is nothing that we could ever do to repay you. All that we could do is call you Father and long to please you as we cleave to Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.